And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Three tips to help you get the pedal C on trumpet. And then pedal C downwards. Pedal T, pedal C starts off tier two pedal tones. Many of you can't even get the pedal C to be even begin to get into the tier two range of pedal tones. Tier two range of pedal tones is the most difficult of all pedal tones. And they are also the pedal tones responsible for really increasing your power and your high range. Uh, they tend to have a real raspy, nasally trombone sound, and we do want to play them as loud as we can. So, all right, tip number one, we're going to cheat. <laughs> Sometimes cheating helps. So, if you can't play the low C, and then drop down an octave to the pedal C open, that's actually really, really loud, folks. That's probably about three Fs. I can back off a little bit. You can actually cheat and play one, two, and three for the pedal C. Now, what happens when you play one, two, and C? You'll notice that the quality of tone and timbre changes to that of tier one pedal tones. So, tier one pedal tones are medium, uh, medium in difficulty. So, they're not too easy. They're not too hard. They're kind of right in between. By adding one, two, and three, you now bump the pedal, the pedal C back up into tier one. It'll be a little bit easier for you, but at least you're still getting it. Now listen to the difference. We'll see. Now I'm going to cheat and play one, two, and three for the pedal. Sounds pretty, right? Compared to that's the real pedal tone. Okay, so first way to get it is to cheat and to use one, two, and three to get the pedal tone out. While you're doing that, you could, um, just for giggles, throw off the, the all three valves at once and see where you are at and trying to get a piece of that pedal C. Watch. Now I'm making that look really, really easy, folks. But what's going to happen is, as soon as you throw your fingers off, you're going to see where some of your deficits are in your in your chops and what you need to work on, because that note might drop or it'll go up. Always remember this, the only reason you can never get any pedal tone is lack of embouchure strength. That includes your lips. Remember, pedal tones don't really exist on the horn um, acoustically. You're, we're actually manipulating things to get them to come out. So. Um, never come up with an excuse of why you can't play the pedal tones, the horn or the mouthpiece or whatever. Uh, it's always due to a lack of embouchure strength. If you can't go through all uh, four, at least four tiers of the pedal tones, all of them, it's due to a lack of strength here and also your lips. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, the second tip now to be able to help you reach that pedal C is uh, for many people, they describe the pedal C as a note that's not on the horn that they can never get. It doesn't exist. It's just not there. It, remember, the reason, the only reason it's not there is because you don't have enough strength here. That's simply the answer. So, okay, what can we do for um, our second tip to get into the pedal, uh, pedal C? Do the scoop method. A lot of times, um, intermediate and advanced players um, will try to get the pedal C to come out, but they'll come in around an A or B flat. It comes out something like this. And they're fighting, but that's actually a good a good way to fight it. You want to fight and and sharpen and raise the pitch. Well, actually, I hit it pretty too close there. Let me go down under a little bit more. See how I did that? We're scooping into it. So that's tip number two, scoop. Okay, again, I'm making that look quite easy. You won't likely be able to do that right when you first try it. But listen, 
how did I get to do it? By practicing. I practiced until my, until my lips were falling off to get these pelotons a long, long time ago. You got to practice it. You increase the strength and you'll get it to come out. Um, the third way, now this is a little bit more of an advanced technique, so you should already be familiar with tongue arch. And so tongue arch is what we use normally when we ascend and we want to get above the staff and keep going higher. We're also using it when we're doing our shakes and our, and our lip throws, right? You can actually employ the tongue arch in the tier two pedal tone range because tier two pedal tones are almost a substitute or kissing cousin for practicing in the upper register. Okay, yeah, so the third way and tip for getting your first pedal C, or at least pushing that direction, is use a tongue arch, as I already mentioned before. Um, you start off with the low C positioning, which is a drop jaw, a little bit wider aperture, and your tongue's flat in your mouth, like you're saying, ah, you got an egg in your mouth. Just a little bit of exaggeration. But instead of freezing and keeping that same um, position in your mouth, you're going to bring your chin up, you're going to arch your tongue up into a knee position as you go down to the pedal seat. Oh, ye. Oh, ye. And so you're going to have, of course, when you put your tongue into the tongue arch position, you're going to have to actually blow harder because now you're bloating gets more resistance. That resistance is the tongue in your mouth. You're going to blow harder. you got to blow more air. Actually, you're not going to blow more air. You're going to blow air. It's going to seem like you're blowing more air, but you're blowing against this resistance, and that actually speeds up the air. There we go. That's a little bit better description. But you'll feel like you're, you're forcing, like you're blowing more um, when you put the tongue in that arch position. I have my tongue right um, curled up as much as I could, arched as much as I could to get that pedal C out. I can still do it low. It's, it's harder, it's less efficient. That's, a, that's no arc, that's no tongue arc. That relies on, on lots of air and pure armature strength, so the tongue arch makes things more efficient down in the tier 2 pedal range. That was with tongue arch. So to recap, the three tips and tricks and techniques you can use to get your first pedal C to come out and then keep continuing down in tier two pedal tones all the way to G flat, pedal G flat. What, what was the first one? What, you don't remember? Cheating. Cheating is number one. The second one is doing the what? I think someone got it. You know, it's like those Fritos. Ah, you got it. Scoops. You seen those Frito scoops? Yes. Scoop. Got to scoop the note. And then the third way is what we just finished up on is using the tongue arch. So these are the three ways that are going to push you in the right positive direction for getting your first pedal C on the horn. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day.
Hey, I'm Kurt Thompson, and you're at Your Brass Instructor. Check out all my videos. You're going to find a lot of great, helpful information. My main niche is upper register, high range, power, and endurance. And that's what the focus is on here at Your Brass Instructor. Incredibly, I have reduced my 16-week course instant download to below $200. Can't beat it. It's like a month of lessons, but a semester-long course that will change your life. Don't take my word for it. Go through my channel and watch the hundreds of reviews of people who have graduated from this course. You can't miss it. And like I've been saying, would you trade 200 bucks to add four notes to your range? Of course you would. Catch you later. familiar with. It's the red Dr. Charles Colon Advanced Look Flexibilities for a Trumpet, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. In my opinion, as an advanced trumpet player, as a semi-pro player, as a professional, you should have already gone through most of this book. Now, not everybody can get to the back of the book, but um, you should try, definitely. Um, you should know this book pretty much inside and out. You should have mastered it as much as you can. And if you tell me that you did, um, I don't even need to hear you play it. I know that you're probably a pretty good player. If you have no clue what this book is all about, and you've never gone through it, my guess is that you still have a lot of work left to do on the trumpet. But we're talking about starting at the very end of this book today, not the beginning. It's not a beginning or intermediate lesson. We're going to turn to the very back of the book, which is the last section in the book. It's like page 79. It's section 8C to A above high C. And a lot of people um, try to get through the book. Some people actually arrive at the end of the book and um, finish that last one, maybe just barely. Or maybe they can actually finish it and then they think they're done and they've arrived. But no, that's not the case. So we have some things that are out of the scope of this book and many other methods as far as upper register that you can keep pursuing to develop yourself into um, the best that you can be. just for time's sake because my important message to you is what we're going to do after that. So let's um, do uh, maybe one or two more of these and I have my own way of doing it. I realize that some of you guys may start and hold that in the first note um, as indicated with a fermata. You may go to the other notes and hold those longer but not me. I have my own way that I've been doing it for years and so I'm just going to do it how I do it. It works best for me. I do throw in some extra notes at the end. I throw in some pedal tones just because um, even though you're doing lip flexibility studies and the name flexibility implies um, some, flexi some flexibility in your lips, well, you do a lot of these and your lips actually start to stiffen up if you do too many. And you have to do too many uh, um, on a regular basis, uh, not every day, but to be able to build. To maintain you don't, but to build you have to do kind of overdo it so you get stronger. So I'm going to pick another one. Let's go to... Um, 24E, and that starts on high C, first bell. And then the last one, which is um, 
24G D high D. the book think that you're done and maybe you're gonna go back and double dabble through the book um, but that's not gonna get you anywhere because you've actually done the hardest one in the book so if you kind of work your way backwards just for maintenance you're just gonna maintain what you got and you're not gonna get any better your range is not really gonna improve you might improve your endurance a little bit but that's about it so where do we continue on this exercise we continue with E flat and you start off with two and three we got the E flat two and three up there after the D. That's where we continue. The same format. And you keep working yourself up. Now, I'm not going to go through each one, but for me, I actually go up to double G. So that was E flat. So I do E flat, I'd rest a little bit. E, rest, F, rest, F sharp, and then I'd hit the double G. When you do the lip, that last one on double G, you're actually getting up to like a triple D. Or some people might call it a double D. Anyway, you're above um, super C that way. That's usually where I stop for my maintenance right now. If I'm really preparing for a show, or if I'm really trying to build, I will actually force out um, some more lip trail studies above that one. And there you start approaching the triple C when you do that. And it's good for you if you really have some stuff that's going to be challenging you. So I'm going to do maybe two more. So we just did E flat, and then you would go to E, one and two, F first, F sharp second, and then G is about usually where I end up on a regular basis. So we'll go to F. should have been double C. So uh, the last one would be G. Let's just pretend that you did F sharp, which I didn't do, but you're going to do F sharp, take a break, and then you're going to start on double G, and your top note should be the D above that. some exercises that you can do past the end of this book. Now, there are so many other techniques that I do beyond the scope of most books. Um, some I've commingled with other exercises from other people, and some exercises are things I've made up on my own. But um, when you're trying to develop your upper register and your high notes and your sound and your tone way up high, there's no question. If you're not doing these types of lip flexibility exercises, um, my guess is either that you're not up there that high, or if you are, you got one of those real thin, shrill, annoying, lead playing kind of upper register sounds that uh, most people just can't stand to listen to. And I, there's some famous people out there who have that kind of sound. I think we know who we're talking about. But you don't want to end up sound like that. You want to get a nice, big, round Bill Chase, Doc Severinsen, Maynard Ferguson, should have mentioned him first, but um, those are the sounds that you want to get. A nice, big, round, beautiful tone in the upper register, not a shrill, shrieking, um, thin, annoying, high note of sounds that sounds like someone just backed over a cat. And some people can play high and sound like that, but hopefully you won't be sounding like that after this. See you in the next lesson. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one.
Hey, I'm here going to talk about tongue arch a little bit. <sighs> Simply because although I've tried to explain it before, even demonstrate it before, people still have trouble actually doing it. Now a lot of people think that they're doing tongue arch. This is for all brass players really. Um, tongue arch as you probably should know is like the second stage of compression. Diaphragm first, tongue arch in the bottleneck of the throat second, and your aperture and your ability to keep your aperture narrow is the third stage of compression. But it's that second stage of compression which is really important in the, 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 the problematic area for most brass players. A lot of you think you're doing it, but you're not. I can instantly recognize, I don't even need to hear you in the same room. And that's why I'm so effective teaching on phone and by Skype. I can hear when someone is not doing tongue arch because they have this strained force sound that does not come with a tongue arch. It comes when you're not doing the tongue arch. You got the tongue arch, it's free, it's effortless. You can just tell there's a different kind of quality to the sound. I'm gonna try to get down and dirty in my mouth. I think you can see it. It's not gonna be pleasant. But some of you got to realize what's going on. When I talk about roll in and roll out, a lot of people don't get that. Um, I'm not sure why that is. So first of all, first off, um, you need to understand the concept of roll out and roll in. Roll out, roll in. Okay. When you are going higher. Eventually, when you really get an expertise at the upper register, you can do both of this in real time. And you can do it in the form of a glissando. Um, here's like low A. I'm not warmed up, folks, so pardon me here. Look at That's kind of a roll out, isn't it? More roll in, right? Even more roll in. Awesome roll in, okay? So I went from here. Sorry, it's flat. Not much roll in. In real time. A little bit sloppy. That's real-time rolling, folks. To be able to do what I just did, you have to be able to roll your lips in and roll them out in real time. Now, for those of you who haven't um, graduated to that level, and actually, um, it's very, very difficult. Um, I have to say that um, I don't meet too many people that can do that. It's just difficult. So, your second best way to do it would be to already have the roll-in in place. Okay. So when you're wanting to play higher, or if you have to start a higher passage, you need to already be rolled in. You can't start above the staff um, with a roll out. It's just going to have that strain sound. Even with my tongue arch. Let's roll out. Recognize that sound? I certainly do. Because I hear it in a lot of people that I teach. And most of the time when they get done with me, they don't make that sound anymore. Because they've learned proper tongue arch and roll in. So you can't start a passage. Let's go back real quick. Ultimately, you want to be able to do what I just did. Roll in and roll out in real time. Okay, that's ultimately. But during the interim, while you're still getting this down, you at least got to roll in when you're starting a higher passage. So you can't start above the staff with the roll out. You gotta start with the roll in. Roll them in. Roll in. That's rolling, folks. Seems like a lot of people don't get that. Um, I hardly ever get on the forums anymore for obvious reasons, but when I've gotten on there, 
it seems like every every other topic is about roll in and roll out. So people are still having tons and tons of problems with roll in and roll out. So get the roll in down. Now when you get the roll in down, you roll in your lips as much as possible and you're trying to put as much lip tissue into the mouthpiece as possible to play higher. So I'm rolling in. Let's say I want to go, let's just like ridiculously higher. I got to really roll in. I am a dry lip player by the way, but sorry. I'm just trying to get my roll in without scraping up my lips too much. Roll in. Now put, now I'm going to put some pressure and put as much lips in the mouthpiece as I can. Actually, that wasn't too horribly difficult for me. I'm not really warmed up. It's almost impossible to play too um, low or even low at all with the roll in as extreme as I was doing. Watch. I mean, even that high C felt low to me. So, roll in extreme. I mean, I'm having trouble getting the high C out practically because I've rolled in so much and I got so much lip tissue that it really narrows down the aperture. Now I'll roll out a little bit. A little bit more. So for me, I actually had to roll out considerably to accommodate the high C, probably because I'm used to playing so much past that. And for you, you're gonna have to feel where you are on the instrument. You have to get the roll in, folks. It has to be there. Learn it, do it, use it. Now, if you got the roll in without the tongue arch, remember at the beginning I was doing the roll out on the high A, but with the tongue arch. What happens if you have the roll in with no tongue arch? Other people sound like this. So they got the roll in part down, but they don't have a tongue arch. So it sounds like this roll in. Again, the hallmark of somebody who is not doing the tongue arch properly is a very forced and strained sound. And of course, you don't really have a lot of good range if you're not doing the tongue arch at all. So, hope you recognize that sound. If you hear that in your own sound, you need to start uh, paying attention here and get with the program. Get that tongue arch down, get the roll in. So, roll in, or roll in, but no tongue arch. Listen to the difference when I go higher. Okay, roll in. Drop my tongue. Sounds like crap, doesn't it? It's got that forced, strained, quivering, wavering tone uh, that people get when they're not using tongue arch. So put the tongue arch back on, and I don't know if you can tell this, but I'm one arming this myself, which is not easy um, to play and do this at the same time. But I'm actually holding the camera. With tongue arch. Notes lock in. In fact, that almost hurt my ears, folks. That was louder than, okay? <laughs> wow. So, um, and I was one one arm banded on that double um, A scale, right? So, now let's go back to what's going on inside your mouth. Low C positioning. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, there you go. You can see my tongue. Ah. Uh, so, for low C. Ah. Uh, I'm going to freeze my tongue when I get done playing with no tongue arch. Low C. Notice there's hardly any roll in. It's just more of a roll out.
that's where my tongue was. Flat with that kind of dip into it. Let's see what happens if you do the tongue arch. Now the tongue arch should be with your tip of your tongue right there behind your teeth. Here. Okay, now you got the first part of the tongue arch. Now the tongue arches up. That is your tongue arch when your teeth are shut. Okay, it's not here. Some people are doing all kinds of wacky crap and it's not going to help you. In fact, I don't even know how some people can do it. Your tongue arch is not just arching up like that. I don't even know how you can play if you're doing that, but some people are arching it up, but they still sound pretty bad. And the reason is you have to have your tongue anchored. The tongue can be anchored at the top of the bottom teeth. Here's the, the bottom teeth, obviously, but near the top. Right there. Or down lower. I'm right down almost at the gum line. You getting this, folks? Oh, uh, why are we doing this? Because no air is coming around the sides of your tongue. The only the air can come up and over the tongue and come down and come out your aperture. That's why just building lip strength and chops is not to be all into all to everything because you have to have this air sped up at the second stage of compression. There is coming up here. Now you've already got the first stage, uh, stage down. We're not going to talk about that right now with the diaphragm. But basically it's, it's a bottled up high compressed air. So that's diaphragm. The air is coming up through your throat. It comes in and immediately it should meet the resistance of your tongue. Resistance meaning you reduce the space in your mouth. Ah, E. Now it has to travel up and down. And when it comes down, it comes down right there. It comes out your aperture. You got to get that, folks. If you don't get that, you can actually go through my four-month program and build up chops of steel and, yes, have gain in range and endurance, but you are you haven't hit that sweet spot. You're still going to be struggling with mouthpiece pressure. Even though you've, you have strengthened all this up, you have strengthened up a lot of things um, during my course, or if you take somebody else's course, but if you don't get the tongue arch, you're really missing that sweet spot that um, a lot of people that excel in the upper register are enjoying. It just makes life a lot easier and more efficient. So you got to get that down. You need to invest whatever time it takes for you to get the feel down for yourself. Ah. Uh, that's low C for me. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Now, when I go above high C, my tongue arch is so high that it's rubbing against the roof of my mouth and almost stopping the bulk of air to come through. I mean, I'm really blowing hard to meet, not because the note's um, hard or high, because it's meeting a tremendous amount of resistance. Um, inside my mouth. Once I meet that resistance, the air spins out so fast, and then you see what happens with the roll in. Everything links and syncs up to be able to get those high notes out with the least amount of effort and the most amount of efficiency. So, again, low C. I'll freeze it. That's where my tongue was, and you saw where my lips were pretty much a rollout. <laughs> tongue still low, but it is higher than it was with the low C, and my jaw is up. Low C, middle C is more up. So I think your jaw dropping down. 
when you go lower. I'm exaggerating. Up. And it goes up as high as you can get it when you're really going into the upper register and the extreme upper register. So high C. Hey. You see the beginning of my tongue arch? So I didn't even have a full tongue arch for my high C. Don't need it. I guess I'm just a little bit lucky. I just don't need it after doing it for all these years because I also have this to rely on. And also I also have a lot of hot air. I think uh, people know that one, right? So that's even when I'm not playing the horn. Now let's go a little bit higher. Um, roll in. Oh yeah, tongue arch was up there, way up there, and almost probably at the max, but not quite, because my max starts to get, uh, my, my tongue really, I can feel the brunt impact of it when, uh, for me, when I'm going to my highest notes. Ah, got the B out, not the double, not the triple C. Once I'm at, for me, uh, triple A, triple B, and triple C, my tongue is like, uh, it's just shaking, it's just grinding as hard as it can to, to lift up and close off the air at the roof because it's trying to make just a little pinprick of a space for the air to come through extremely fast and then come down. And then after that, it's up for my lips to be able to continue grip into the mouthpiece and hold that narrow aperture. As soon as you have a millimeter flinch where your lips can't do that, all of a sudden you, you drop. You could drop a fifth when you're up that high. So I hope this video helped explain what most of you think you are doing, but you're not. Tongue arch, just like diaphragm, is not theoretical. It's something that you really employ you really employ so tongue arch take a good look roll in tongue arch it's not pleasant to look at but so many people have problems with that uh, you just need a little tough unpleasant love in this video so we talked about roll in, roll out. I got up close and personal. Roll in. Sorry, roll out. Roll in. Roll out. Roll in. You need to understand that concept and you actually need to, need to be able to apply it. That means really do it. Not something you're thinking about. You are really doing the roll in and roll out. You are really doing the tongue arch and then flattening the tongue back out when you go lower. You are really moving your jaw up and down, depending on what register you're playing in. These are things you're really doing, and if you're not really doing, but you're just thinking about them, you really are having problems, and you're not sounding the way that you likely could. So this is all about technique and feel. It's like riding a bike, there's a technique to it, but also there's a feel that you got to learn, right? So technique and feel. This is not about um, lifting weights and getting stronger, making your chops stronger. This is all about applying technique to what you've actually done, the conditioning of your embouchure and your lips. You apply this to technique to it, and it's just you're going to have that wow experience. So now, for those of you who thought that you could just watch this video and sail on into the silvery seas uh, with no more problems, no. Uh, upper register and endurance is the most challenging technique on the instrument, bar none, bar none. So um, I gave you some really good advice on this one to help you, but you still need to get involved in a process. So many people, when I say so many people, it just gets ridiculous. I mean, every time I log on to Facebook, can you help me with a high note tip? 
can you help me with this? Can you show me this? I mean, well, first of all, it's my job, you know, and uh, people sometimes pay me for doing that. But second of all, no, I can't just show you a quick little tip because one quick little tip is not going to help you attain your goals. And the reason is because most people don't understand improving your upper register and endurance is a process that you must go through. It is a process that you must go through. And you need to have somebody show you the correct process and the right timeline to accommodate your goals. And a couple of um, techniques, a routine from some guru, uh, meaning one technique from one, from one routine, or some tips and tricks, just ain't going to cut it. You're just not going to get what you want. So um, I've shown you some pretty good techniques here, which is a part of it. But you have there's no shortcuts. You have to go through the process. You got it, my friends? I hope you do. And I hope this helped. Bye for now. It's Kurt Thompson. And you haven't forgotten my website, have you? TrumpetSizzle.com. Back in 1984, we put out an album that was supposedly my retirement album from the Air Force. It was called Bone Voyage. And uh, we're going to do a tune that should have been on the album. Unfortunately, it wasn't written in time. But Rick Whitehead, our guitarist, put it together for the four trombones and rhythm section. We'd like to do it for you right now. A little Sonny Robbins thing entitled St. Thomas.
Must have been the music, huh? Just turned it right side up there and you got it made. They think you made a mistake. You did. Just kidding. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. It made 
framed me as the fool who only aimed to be almost blue, almost touching it will always do. There's a part of me that's always true, always, all the things that you promised with your eyes, I see in hers too. from crying Almost you Almost me Almost Look at those chops, baby. <laughs> That's what happens when you grind out some super duper power high notes. Hey, this is not a mystery. All you got to do is get involved in my 16 week upper register course for all brass. And starting for 2019, I have a very unique twist, financial twist. You can get involved for $21. Easy, right? If you would dream of playing like what you just heard, the power, the range, the technique, the accuracy, it's not a pie in the sky dream. It's attainable, but you have to get involved in my course. There's no other course on the planet at the moment anywhere that comes close to the success rate of my 16 week Brass Upper Register course. Test me on that one. Try to find another course that even equals mine. You won't find it. I'm Kurt Thompson. Look in the description below. There will be a link. I hope to have you join me in 2019. And it feels amazing to be this strong and this powerful on this instrument. Happy New Year. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of flexibility stuff out of the Arvin. This is number 30, page 47. And so um, this is definitely a measure of flexibility. And um, if you're working on your high range and other stuff, you definitely have to have flexibility as well. So um, let me um, flip this around if I can. Here we go, Arbenz, page 47, number 30, a little flexibility action for you. Got the metronome set around 84. One, two, one, two.
Okay, I got one of these Bach visualizers. Uh, it's kind of a conjunction with that clear mouthpiece that I just used. Um, I never have really fooled with uh, micromanaging and overanalyzing my embouchure and what it looks like in the mouthpiece, but I've had a lot of requests, um, especially over the last couple of years, and so um, what the heck. This is the Bach 1.5C, I do believe. I just ordered it. And um, it's the visualizer. And you know, I'm not really big on these um, bigger mouthpieces for what I do. Um, if I was a, a symphony player 100% of the time, then I, of course I would have to be very um, selective on what I'm playing on, and this might be included. But um, we can start off with something I'm going to put it up okay go up a little bit more <laughs> trying to get it as close as I can this should be a high C coming up Scoop it up another octave. Double C. Almost trying to get the triple to G to come out. Not quite. Go back to double C. That felt more comfortable. drop it down lower yeah, even lower than that I don't even know if I can get a pedal tone let's see I skipped the whole tier went down to the fourth tier and it didn't even sound that good so um, anyway I don't see myself using this as a tool for anything that um, I would use to enhance my playing but it is kind of um, interesting to look at maybe where my lips are what happens when I get ready to set up well let's kind of have a diagonal look if you I don't know if you noticed that so I'm here but when I really set up there's watches there's kind of a diagonal movement here I don't know if you saw that Barely, folks. <laughs> I'm working hard here. Anyway, so that's this guy here. I'm going to take a look at this when I get done and see if I can spot some interesting things when it comes to this um, Amateur Visualizer. And as it, you have probably seen from some of my most recent tutorials, um, I'm not big on overanalyzing um, Amateur unless you've built up some serious strength here first and are still having lots of trouble. I'm a firm believer that most embouchure problems can be rectified with um, strong embouchure and strong and strong, strong strong lips, easy for me to say. Um, if you have strengthened your corners, your embouchure and your lips and everything else is right but you're still having lots of problems then um, yeah we could probably adjust your embouchure. Um, you should check out my other video, in fact I should leave a link for that. Um, I'm just basically hitting the armature from any single, from every 
um, possible angle and level that you can. And um, anyway, I'll put a link in this description here below. So that is the Avisher Visualizer. Um, doesn't really float my boat that much, but some people get all excited about it. So I put it up there if people want to just take a gander. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, it's National Anthem time. Bring it.
Back to Nature with Bill Adam, Lead Pipe Buzzing, Advanced Trumpet Lesson here. Kurt Thompson, I'm going to expose you to a very, very useful, powerful, and efficient practice technique. And this is actually going to be more doable and more absorbable if you've already been doing the Bill Adams routines and the Bill Adam routine. I always like to pronounce his name with an S. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bill Adam was the best trumpet teacher at Indiana in Bloomington, bar none. There's no one that's even close to him uh, before or after. And it's just too bad that um, he's not still teaching. And he's, you know, of course he's getting older. Um, in fact, I haven't even checked to see if he's still around, but I hope that he is. Um, anyway, even if he is, I mean, he's just the best teacher at Indiana, and he came up with a lot of cool stuff. And what, I played with a lot of IU guys um, back in the day, and uh, these guys were all good players with huge, big sounds. And I believe that they got that partly from Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. And we're not going to go into his whole routine because you could actually spend an hour and a half or two hours doing all the Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. But I tweaked and twisted and manipulated um, my own advanced version of Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing. It's just a little snippet. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be starting on perfect force from second line G to middle C and working our way down. And as you'll soon discover, this is going to be very, very difficult to do unless you have extreme flexibility and power built up in your chops. So G to C. Okay, a little flat. Now I'm pulling out the, the lead pipe or the tuning slide. So I'll be blowing just through the lead pipe. The same thing. So you can see that I'm actually blowing out through here and not through the whole horn. And you probably could tell by the tone quality. Okay, let's work our way down. Now, most of you probably can get that one. That was G to C. How about F sharp to B? Take the lead pipe out. I'll do it like this so you can see what's going on. Okay. You probably are noticing it's getting extremely hard and it's going to get about impossible in the next one or two for you. It's going to feel that way. So F and E flat. Pull this guy out. F to B flat. lot of intention and focus on my part to get that out and now we're going to go to a little fly on my pipe. now we're going to go to e to a so one and two bottom of the stop e to a take out this guy For many of you, that would have been almost impossible. I thought I heard a monkey over there in the trees. You hear that? It is back to nature time with Kurt Thompson, but I didn't know that we got monkey in the trees and uh, chimpanzees. But anyway, uh, if I don't make it, there he goes again. If I don't make it through this video, you'll know what happened to me. I got taken out by a monkey or chimpanzees. Okay, now it's going to get really hard. In fact, this gets hard for me. E flat to A flat. Pull this guy out. Boom, center that note. And the last one that we will do will be D to G.
and there you have it. You can consider this extremely, extremely advanced. And um, I put this particular technique that I just did to even the best players on the planet. And um, if you just sprung it on them and made them do it right without even had a, having a chance to look at it, um, probably nine or ten out of ten out of them, I don't care who it is, would have difficulty going through this advanced Bill Adam lead pipe buzzing technique. So the physical part of the horn, yes, the high notes, but listen, so many people that can play high have a real shrill, thin sound. And it, so it's not about just being able to play high. If you have a real shrieky, shrill, thin falsetto kind of sound, who cares? There were people that were playing back when Maynard Ferguson uh, was kicking butt when he was a lot younger in the 40s and 50s that could also play high. Well, how come we didn't hear about them and they didn't get that famous? It's because they had that shrieky, thin, falsetto kind of sound that nobody wants to listen to. Maynard's sound was thick and brassy all the way up. That's why. So this is a technique here that will improve your sound. So with whatever range that you have, you're going to have a thicker, fuller, maybe even warmer a type of sound in the upper register and then all registers really. Now if what I just did today on the horn seemed almost impossible to you, there's usually just one reason why that would be. It's simply a lack of armature strength. Not really talent here. A lack of armature strength. So you don't need to feel like you don't have the talent. You actually got what it takes but you have to have someone show you the right way to do it in the most efficient way to do it. So if I've perked up your interest and you'd like to learn more about the stuff that I do, which for the last nine years in my um, online programs, is it nine years? Sorry, seven years, has been truly effective for just about anybody that has gone through my courses. It's not a walk in the park. You will pay your dues, you will invest time, and you will invest money. And it will take some hard work and effort. But the results are pretty amazing. And they're long-lasting for your life. So it's something that if you've been thinking about it, you just need to pull the trigger and do it now. Take care of this. Get it handled. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, one of my students, Tom Granoff, told me about... A master class that he went to quite a long time ago where Bobby Shu came in talked about his breathing techniques like the wedge breath and all that and then picked up the trumpet by a second valve and played a few high notes that were pretty meaty and um, so I thought I would try to see if I can demonstrate the Bobby Shu I would just call this probably the Bobby Shu no pressure um, high note test so you can do this after you watch this. You can try it right out if you're in a practice room. So what I was told by Tom is that I guess um, Bobby just grabbed the middle valve like that and proceeded to play a couple. I don't. Whoop, my valve's starting to unwind. Proceeded to play a couple of notes. So I'm going to try it here. Just a couple of notes. <laughs> So that was a pretty loud double G just by doing the Bobby Shoe method of holding on to the middle valve. You, even though I was trying to pull in, you really can't pull in too much, folks, as opposed to when you got, you know, both arms grabbing and pulling in. So you got just your fingers holding on to this. Part of it's holding the weight of the horn from dropping. So anyway, that's the Bobby Shoe uh, no pressure high note test. You saw it here probably for the first time because I just found out about it from Tom Granoff. Thanks, Tom. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day.
Okay, this will be a discussion about brass embouchure and the differences in embouchure and how even if you think you might have a bad embouchure it can be overcome by strengthening your embouchure from all different kinds of directions and I'm going to play some embouchures that um, are bad for me and that typically for me I would not be able to play very well using these type of embouchures. Now one thing to keep in mind no one embouchure is really bad for an individual and so what that really means is what might be bad for me and I sound horrible on might be really good for you and so it depends on if you look carefully your lips how long they are, how short they are, how narrow they are, how thick they are, how thin they are, your teeth how much of an overbite you have, how much of an underbite you have, um, if they're crooked, if you're wearing braces, so if maybe you have um, a partial denture, so it can include a lot of different things. And also your just your bone and jaw structure. That's why I think that um, some brass coaches and teachers can do more harm to a student by forcing them into a particular embouchure. Um, for example, the most common would be centered and a little bit more on the top lip. That seems to be you know, the most common. But not everybody is going to do well with that particular embouchure. Um, the other thing that you should be aware of is that if you attempt to drastically change your embouchure, it seems like in my experience and opinion, people that have done that end up really not faring any better. In fact, a lot of people get worse. So if you think a big drastic embouchure change is the answer, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. So let's look at some various embouchures. Um, here we can see. For me, I tend to play a little, a little higher. So I guess you got your um, high high player or high lip placement uh, position. You got your medium or middle and your low. So those, those would be the different um, placements. So high would be it's probably high. Now I can go higher. But that's probably close to where I normally would play. Now what happens if I wasn't playing that way and I was using a you know an embouchure that was bad for me? Um, let's try something. Let's drop it way down. So I'm up here. Let's go on way down. Way down. Hear the difference in tone quality? But guess what? I'm still able to get the high C. I'm still able to play. But it doesn't sound that good. But I can still do it. Um, let's go maybe um, medium. So normally I play here. Let's go down just a little bit. Seemed like it noticeably flat on the high C. I think I was flat on the first one too. But so I'm still able to play. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna be tying this all into a huge point here. Um, okay, so now let's talk about angles. So. I can use my normal armature here. What if I bringled it up? Because I see people playing like this. Okay, it had a significant high angle to it. One of the most interesting um, armatures I've ever seen is uh, by Stan Mark, the famously trumpet player for Maynard Ferguson. I don't know how he can play the way he does. Um, take a look at it. It's like he puts the trumpet up straight, and then he comes up to <laughs> he comes up to the mouthpiece. You really got to watch him do it when he's playing live. It's he um, it's very interesting. He's got the trumpet here, and then he'll come up. So the trumpet's actually straight up, but he's coming up at this angle. So <laughs> now the. Most of the embouchures that I'm showing you are ones that I really couldn't play on. In fact, if I was playing on them, I might be just like you are right now. If you have a particular question about your embouchure 
and then it's not working for you. Well, if my trumpet teacher long ago had said you need to play like this, like Stan Mark, so I got the horn out, I'm coming into it like this. Well, I mean, if I was using that Amish all along thinking that, that that was how it was supposed to be, um, I would be having a lot of trouble and I would be wanting to look at a video like this to change my armature or do something about it. So, um, okay, so now we got, we had, we had the upper angle like that. We had, did we do this one yet? Well, I think that's kind of like, more like Stan Marks, isn't it? Yeah, it's more, it's more of a, he's coming into like that, but you can still go downwards. Okay, now, um, what if you don't play center? A lot of us brass teachers want you know, kids to be centered right smack dab in the middle of their lips. Unfortunately, our jaw structure and teeth and everything else might suggest otherwise. So, um, here's me, I'm, I'm center now. I'm a little bit off center, I guess. Um, it's kind of difficult to do this too um, while I'm playing, but I wanted to get the camera up close, and so I needed to be holding the camera. Okay, so here, here's kind of where I normally play. What if I didn't play centered? I played off. I can still get it. It's a little bit crackly. What if I go way over? What if I'm crazy and I go way over here? And that's a real screwed up homager, isn't it? Uh, okay, let me try playing the horn left-handed here and hold the camera this other way. So, go back to center. Or center for me. Let's move it over to the left a little bit. Let's just say I played a little bit off. Okay? That's kind of wacky, isn't it? But some people play in all these different positions. Now, no, I've never seen anybody really play out here. But um, what if we go over here? I'm, I'm going to go crazy. Look at that. All right. So you saw various positions from high to medium to low, mouthpiece placement. And, of course, each one of those takes a different armature. Um, to be able to play, right? Um, you saw me go over a little off-center, way off-center, back to center, off-center this way, and way off. And then you saw the horn angles, horn angles like this, and then down. So I basically covered uh, just about any embouchure that a brass player could play with. Now, the point I'm trying to make in all of this is that there's one reason that I could go up to high C on all those angles, all those embouchures. Now, granted, you notice that the tone quality went way out the window on a lot of them. And obviously, that would mean that I wouldn't use that particular embouchure, right? But how am I able to do that? And if I wanted to, folks, I can switch my embouchure to any embouchure and um, start to get comfortable and familiar with it and uh, let it sink in. It takes me about a week. And I'm able to do all that because of an extreme amount of strength that I build up in the embouchure and the lips. So what is my real point to you brass players out there that are micromanaging yourself, that are being um, confused by too much worry and thinking um, what's that um, analysis by paralysis kind of thing over analyzing everything so my advice to you is number one you need to do something that will hit your embouchure from so many different directions that it almost won't even matter what embouchure that you use I mean you want to use the embouchure where you feel most comfortable where you get the best sound the best tone and things just feel right. You don't want to use the embouchure that a teacher tells you to use and it feels horrible. It always seems bad. You, it seems like you're always struggling. Of course, you don't have any high range and your endurance is shot. 
but supposedly, quote unquote, that's the place where you should put it. Um, ideally, I like to have my students, my younger ones, start off with um, centered on the lips and slightly a little higher on your top lip. But it, sometimes that doesn't work for them, you know, depending on what I see going on with them and, um, you know, their, their teeth structure and other things in their lips. Sometimes we have to bring it back right down to the center and sometimes even go down a little bit lower. Sometimes the upstream uh, player um, will not be an upstream player until um, he or she or their teacher figures that out. So if a student is not doing too well with the typical embouchure that I like to get them started on, well, I'll start playing with it. We might move their mouthpiece down and have more of the lower lip inside the cup. And if they do a lot better with that, then hey, why not? That's them. Why not let them do that? So you need to strengthen your chops, your embouchure, and your lips in many different directions. So what did we learn? We learned that not one particular embouchure is suited for everybody. And you may find that playing on embouchure that supposedly does not look good to other players but works for you that may be the embouchure that you need to be using you got to play where it's comfortable where you're sounding good and if you're a little bit off center and if the horn angle like for stan mark look you got to google him and watch him play i mean he's got an extreme angle that he's coming at um i don't know how he does it but it, it works for him and there's other people that play with the horn and extreme up angle and then there's people that play off the side of their the center of their lips. So you got to find the sweet spot for you, not the sweet spot that your teacher thinks is for you. Um, if the teacher thinks of a great embouchure position for you when you were younger and it worked, by all means, that teacher gave you great advice. If the teacher kept forcing you to stay in with a particular setup, but you are not doing that well, uh, that's when you start. You really need to start thinking um, differently. And maybe there might be a different setup uh, for people. In fact, I want to thank Sharon for um, giving me an idea about this particular video. Um, so for people who are concerned about bad embouchures and good embouchures, more mouthpiece pressure, less mouthpiece pressure, I really don't want you to be thinking about that if you're working with me and you're taking lessons from me or you're taking my course. What I want you to be doing is focusing on the 75 techniques, if you're involved in my course, that are going to hit this from so many different angles. In fact, now is a perfect time to plug my course, which you know I almost do in all, almost all my videos. Um, your embouchure and the muscles here in your lips need to be worked in so many different directions. And you know what that really does is it makes worrying about embouchure and everything else, angles, and where your mouthpiece is um, hitting your lips too high, too low, in the middle, off center, almost irrelevant because once you develop chops of steel, um, you can play, pretty much play anywhere that you wanted. I, did, I demonstrated that, right? I mean, I took the angles all over my mouth and I was still able to get up to high C. You just probably heard a change in tone quality from either decent to, to bad. But still, I was able to do it, mainly because of this. So, you need, if you're concerned about your embouchure, lack of strength, um, or maybe you're using a bad embouchure, you're using excessive pressure, there's really only one answer, and you're going to have to come to the conclusion quickly by deferring to someone that knows what they're doing and has worked with a lot of people that would be like me or somebody else in my capacity. Or you can kind of go to the school of hard knocks and keep pounding away at the one method that you're using. Maybe you're not even using a method. Maybe you're just practicing all technique, Clark and Arbins and other stuff and some warm-ups. Or maybe you are involved in a routine. Claude Gordon, only doing Claude Gordon. Or only doing the palming method with William Costello and Roy Stevens. Or only doing the um, isometric stuff of Carmine Crusoe. So if you're pounding away at one routine and you don't want to change, yet you have embouchure problems, endurance problems, range problems, excessive mouthpiece pressure problems, and it doesn't matter if you're on trumpet or trombone or euphonium or French horn or any brass instrument, the mechanics and the approach is still the same basically. Well, you're going to find out 
through the school of hard knocks if you keep insisting on working that one routine for your embouchure development, you're going to find out it doesn't work. It only takes you to a certain amount and you get stuck. So my advice is to go back and rewind this video and watch it again and think to yourself, how is he able to put that mouthpiece in all these wacky positions on his lip up and down and all around, yet still be able to get a high C out on each one? If the answer comes to you that maybe I might have stumbled onto something that's very successful when it comes to embouchure development, then you really need to look in the item description below this video and go to my homepage, trumpetsizzle.com. And I'm mainly addressing people that have embouchure problems, that have problems with too much mouthpiece pressure, that um, maybe play off to the side or too high or too low, or, or maybe need to experiment. The um, 75 techniques in my course almost is an auto correction mechanism for minor amateur problems. In other words, it's hard to go through all 75 techniques and get those down after four months and not have had some kind of shift in your amateur. Your amateur and your mouthpiece placement will shift during the four months. For some, slightly, and for some, noticeably, because you'll need to be able to accommodate those various techniques. And you just can't go through 75 different techniques in four months and not have a change take place here. You're going to have the musculature thicken and develop, but you're also going to have a change take place in the embouchure. So, um, if you don't recognize me by my lips, I'm Kurt Thompson. You may have thought this was somebody else the whole time, but I am Kurt Thompson, and I wanted you to get a close-up of my jaw, my lips, and um, hopefully got close enough, close enough on those different embouchures. So, don't let embouchure scare you or wear you down. You focus instead on building embouchure strength from all kinds of angles and from, from my point of view, 75 techniques with the different angles that, that we're going to hit you at in your embouchure is just the holy grail to upper register and endurance improvement. Well, now that you got to know my lips really good and my embouchure, I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one.
about that?
probably a good thing he didn't use the microphone. <laughs> And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, middle C, high C, and double C buzz, and that's the ultimate test in pure embouchure and lip strength. Notice I was doing the real lip buzz, I wasn't doing the little puff out your thing that 8th graders do. No, I was doing the real lip buzz with an embouchure set, I just fold in like I'm blowing into the horn. So make sure you're comparing apples to apples. What I did was the real lip buzz, free lip buzzing, like you got your armature set. So if you do this, that doesn't that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real free lip buzzing, which requires an enormous amount of armature strength. And you can always just about count on the fact that if you can buzz a certain note, it's likely you can play about an octave higher than that. Buzz a high C, you can probably play double C. Buzz a middle C, you can probably play high C. Buzz a double C, like I just did, you can probably play a triple C, which is true. So there is a correlation between your lip buzz and your strength and what you do on the trumpet, what you do on any other brasses, where it doesn't really matter, tuba, trombone, whatever. So um, embouchure strength is the most important thing the most important aspect of um, brass playing. Take it away and you really have little left. Little left. You might as well just become a singer. I mean, you really do. If you don't have the embouchure strength, you, you can't play, uh, I don't know, maybe you can play um, in, your, in the low register and that's about all you're going to get if you absolutely have no strength here whatsoever. Um, nothing really is going to happen on the horn. You could, you could be an um, Olympic swimmer with great lungs and air. Um, no embouchure strength is going nowhere. So th there you have it. And I will continue on um, with this brass improvement series right here. Hey, today we're going to be talking about chop strength or embouchure strength versus air. And um, it seems like every other day I'm getting an email from somebody um, with a counter point of view um, for myself about air. A lot of times you hear me say, um, air is not the main thing that's gonna get you your range, and it's not the only thing. And then people think that um, I, don't, I don't believe in air at all, and that's not true. Um, but we really need to figure things out. If Now I love Don Jacoby and his stuff. Bill Adams is wonderful. In fact, um, I do a little bit of his stuff in my four month upper register program the lead pipe buzzing and stuff like that. So, and then the other yoga breathing techniques. But air, my friend, if you work only on air and think that's the holy grail to ultimate endurance and upper register, you're gonna fail. That's just the bottom line. And we're gonna find out why today. In fact, I'm gonna prove that air is not the holy grail to upper register. It really is lip and embouchure strength and then the second to that would be how you compress your air. So that is a very important part of being in the upper register and playing that way, um, playing clearly in the upper register. So, um, and I'm not following a script here, I'm just thinking out loud, but um, you need to see a good up close demonstration. That's why I have this camera so close. I want you to notice um, how much air I'm really taking in to be able to get in the upper register. And if 
you have half a brain, you're going to figure things out that um, you got to have the chop strength. You got to have the lip strength. Lip strength is a little different than your embouchure. I mean, than the muscles that surround here. Don't believe me? Watch some autopsies. It's pretty gruesome, but you're going to see that the musculature of the face right through here, our embouchure actually is different tissue than what you have right here. And so this is a little something different here that we want to work on to get stronger. You have to have lip strength to withstand the pressure of the air coming out. So yes, you do need to be able to have um, great air flow and to be able to really compress the air. That's the most important part. So even if you only had one lung, if you had the mechanism set up to really compress that air and everything was synced and coordinated, I'm sure that you could probably still play decently in the upper register and, and expand your range. I'm confident of that. And let's find out why that is. So uh, I'm going to put the mouthpiece up. First of all, I'm going to see if you can get the feeling of when I take a full breath. So here's the full breath. <sighs> okay, so you'll know when I'm taking a full breath. I'm sitting down, so you'll see that I have to do that. Now, if I take a partial breath, I'm, I'm not going to take a full breath. And by the way, this is this video is... Um, in lieu of me writing out a big email for my brass um, techniques improvement series I'm just basically it's going to be this video so you're not going to see a long email this is the next installment in the brass players improvement um, email series I do on Facebook so I'm um, just be watching this and take notes so check this out and I'm going to try to make it clear when I do take a larger breath so you need to see my lips try to get it close I'm putting the mouthpiece up. I'm going to take about 20% air. Here we go. That's it. That's only 20%, folks. Now, I didn't exactly have the accuracy that I wanted because I didn't have the airstream pushing it forward. But that's pure embouchure strength. Let's do it again. I'm going to take about the same amount of air, about 20%. Here we go. It's only 20 I think I got up maybe around the triple F range, give or take. Um, wasn't a lot of air there. Now, I will put in a lot of a lot more air. So let me take in um, double that. Let's go up to about 50%. That's about 50. So I'm getting more sound out. And the air um, that I'm blowing through my chops is more air, more quantity, and it's actually a, probably a little bit faster, of course. Now, because I'm blowing more air, that's activating um, all the muscle contraction in here. It's got to still um, stay sealed on the mouthpiece. Otherwise, the lips would fly up, and you're not going to be able to um, go up any higher. So anyway, that should be really clear. Let's just take another look at that. Um, not much air. So here we go. That's a big breath, and let me let it all out. Basically, you saw me playing a double G, that's a double concert F, on the trumpet with virtually no air. Did, did anybody check that out? I basically had hardly any air. And how loud was it? It came out about MF. So wait a minute. Now, let's go back to Don Jacoby. And um, we can even include Stamps and uh, some of these other guys, um, Bill Adams, uh, real big proponents. Even my hero, Bud Brisboy, real big proponent of um, his wedge breath. He was the he was the original wedge breath guy. Um, shoe came after him. Bud, Boy, Bud Briswell is the original, the originator of um, wedge breath breathing, in case you guys didn't know that. And there's actually two versions. The shoe version, Bobby Shoes, is a little bit different, more applicable to like real-time playing. But Bud Brisboy, uh basically said his way of um, breathing, this wedge breath, was the reason he could play so high and um, um, tell you the truth that was I don't believe that's true <laughs> the guy had incredible chops and um, uh, I'm pretty confident that even if he had not um, only one lung or wasn't breathing as quite as good as he did in the wedge breath um, that he originated he could still play very very well in the upper register 
he had a natural setup. And so I think he was trying to explain why he could play so well. Sometimes when players are born with natural leverage and a natural ability to really compress air, they're not quite exactly sure what they're doing. So they, they look to rationalize how they're able to do it. You can watch Maynard, um, one of the, the ultimate um, talent in upper register. His, just look at his face. He had, the nat- he had a natural setup. His teeth and everything was just perfect for being able to get the high velocity out um, to play in the upper register. Now, of course, he had to work. He had to practice, you know, not shortchanging that. But I think at some point he was trying to figure out how he was actually doing it. He had just this ultimate talent. I mean, he had the perfect leverage just built into a system that a lot of us have to work a lot harder to get. And sometimes we don't even get, um, you know, get to that level. So um, he, you can watch in some of his master classes that he really explains um, about his, that he worked a lot on his breathing and then he leans back. He's really big about bending knees and leaning back. And I'm going to tell you something. And uh, Maynard is also one of my heroes, just along with Bud. But they're trying to explain how they're able to play so easily and well in the upper register when, in fact, they had just like the ultimate amount of talent to be able to do so in natural setup. Um, I'm confident that you can take in a big gulp of air and practice yoga, lean back, bend your knees, and you're not going to be sounding like Maynard. And you're not going to really get that much upper register. You're going to have to do something to strengthen this um, area up here in your face. You have to have the strength up here. There's just no question. And um, what do um, a lot of people tell you to do? Do long tones. Take take stuff up an octave. Play in the upper register. And really work on your airflow. And you'll get there. Uh, Nope. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. Now, it might for some people, some people who are already predisposed and have the natural great leverage in their in their face right here, their tongue. Maybe they got a small. If you have a smaller oral cavity, and you're using your tongue arch, you really can speed up there a lot faster. So, um, and there's a lot of things that really go into this to making um, natural leverage. So yes, the people that have gained a lot of range and can excel very well in the upper and extreme upper register of any brass instrument if they did the long tones if they really worked on their breathing if they played stuff up an octave they might actually just get um, to where they wanted to be and where everybody wants to be but mainly because they had already a predisposition predisposition for natural leverage and um, and a great um, um, compression ability just through their genetics so um, the rest of us uh, you're going to have to really be strategic about getting this strength. And unfortunately, for most of us, not one method and not one technique is going to get you there. In other words, uh, you can't just do Bill Adams' method and get there. It's going to work for some people, but will it work for you or me? I don't know. Um, Claude Gordon, love it. And I actually got something out of it, but is it going to work for you? I. I've been teaching for a long time, and that Claude Gord doesn't work for everybody. It works for me, and uh, not ultimately, but you know, it did help me out at one point. So I love the Claude Gordon stuff. Uh, Roy Stevens, so uh, palming and all that kind of stuff. Will it work for you? It may, and it may not. Reinhardt, all these other methods that are out there. Cat Anderson is the, probably the the toughest method to actually go through. So there's a whole bunch out there. Uh, the only question is will it work for you and those methods are successful for some people but not for everybody of course we already know why it's not successful for everybody it's just fact if one method was actually successful at producing um, gorgeous high notes and upper register abilities and endurance then we would all only use that one method think about it let's use our brain here if one method was that successful we you wouldn't be listening to this right now and i wouldn't be talking about it. everybody could just do it so the fact of the matter is not one method is perfect for everybody. As a result, that's the whole nature of my four-month upper register course. Uh, there are 65 techniques, and these techniques come from um, every method you can think of. The bulk of it are actually my techniques, and I include a lot of breathing for compression and some other stuff. So you have to um, take the macro approach to really build in the strength 
we don't know which one, which particular technique is going to do it for you. I'm confident that um, out of 65, five or 10 are definitely going to be the magic bullet for you. But what's the magic bullet for you? Don't know. And whatever it is, it won't be the same for me or the same for the next guy or gal. So you really have to use your intelligence here if you want to improve your upper register. And keep in mind, the I don't care what instrument you play, I don't care if you're a college professor or you're a comeback player or um, you're a hobbyist or you're a pro player, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is you have to keep improving your range. You can't be subtle on your range, wherever it is at today, because the more range you have, what happens, even if you don't want to play double C's, um, classical guys out there, if you can play a double C, what happens here? Boom. The pressure comes off your lips when you're playing in the in the uh, tessitura that you normally play in, whether it's middle C up to maybe E's. So you don't, you don't have to... Um, have the desire to play double C's. It's just if you can play them in your practice, the pressure comes off here. You get a better sound, a bigger sound, and a lot more endurance. So let's take one more look and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Really, the air is important. And to compress the air, you really have to arch the tongue in your mouth up, like you're saying in or E or T. Your tongue's actually like this, that it's doing the arch like that and you're blowing the air from the back of your throat up and over the tongue and it comes out the aperture now that's great we got to have that air but if you don't have the super strong embouchure chops in the lip able to contract and hold that air into the mouthpiece all the air is just going to be useless for you and that's um, this brass improvement email series Hope you get a lot out of it. You're seeing a real good close-up of me, maybe too close. Let's take another look at the mouthpiece. So I'm putting the mouthpiece right on my chops and take a small amount of air. Okay? Not a whole lot of pressure there, really. And that was probably about 30% of my air capacity. That should prove a point. It should really prove a point that, yes, work on your air, but you need to focus a lot more on how to get this going here. And let me just leave you with this. If you're pounding away and banging your head at one method, and you keep wondering why it doesn't work, but you know it should work because it works for everybody else, well, that's um, erroneous thinking right there. You really need to take the shotgun approach. I'm here to tell you, you got to take the shotgun approach, the macro point of view. Uh, when it comes to really increasing your strength in your face, your lips, and everything else. you just got to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be one of those guys that um, sticks with a method um, because you don't want to, um, I guess, admit that you made the wrong decision. You'll stick with that me method for all your life, and you'll always have problems in the upper register. So use your intelligence. Think about things in an intelligent way. And I'm Kurt Thompson. Hope this made a little sense to you. And today's date, by the way, happens to be March 7th, 2013. Take care.
was a test of your pedal tone ability. I started on first bass F and I worked my way down with a F major concert E flat scale all the way down to triple pedal F. Now that's a test of your overall ability to do pedal tones but keep in mind um, each tier of pedal tones has a different characteristic and a, and a different um, level of difficulty. So briefly um, your bread and butter and your meat and potatoes um, pedal tone tier is the second tier, it's the most hardest tier of all. In fact for those of you who are um, not really um, it, uh, playing up into the upper register, I mean ability to do it, we're, start, we're talking about starting at high C up to about double G give or take. Um, that range right there is the upper register. Above that is the extreme upper register. So um, if you're trying a lot of different things, um, uh, at least check your pedal tones. Um, if you can't do what I just did, um, that may be one place to start looking and start practicing on. Now, um, to be efficient and focused with your time, when it comes to um, gaining strength in, in your armature and a big round sound, especially in all registers, you really want to pay attention to the second tier. So the second, the second tier is the hardest of all pedal tones to play. That starts with pedal C. And I'll just play it down. The best way to do it is just to do octaves, unless you have perfect pitch, uh, it's, which I don't. I got relative perfect pitch, but if you don't have perfect pitch, just go ahead and play the tester note an octave higher. So here's the low C. And then the pedal C. B. B flat. A. A flat. G. Now notice I'm going to play G one and three. Don't cheat and play it open. And then the last one in the second tier of the pedal tones, the um, this is the hardest um, tier of pedal tones would be the G flat or F sharp again. When you go down to play it. Don't cheat and play second valve for the, the pedal. Go ahead and leave it as one, two, and three. Here's the low G flat. Okay, so that's the hardest range. Um, now, the way, let me just describe the different levels of t uh, pedal tones. The first here is from F to D flat. E. E flat. D. Then D flat. Okay, so um, you'll probably be able to get most of those. That's what I consider like a medium difficult level of pedal tones. So the first tier of pedal tones, um, which I just did, is the medium level of difficulty uh, for pedal tones. That's F, pedal F down to pedal D flat. And you already heard me do the most difficult level of pedal tones which I consider your meat and potatoes. Uh, that's where you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck as far as your practice time, especially if you're shooting for um, upper register and power. You're going to get it from the second tier, which is the most hardest. That's pedal C all the way down to pedal G flat. Don't cheat when you get down to pedal G and pedal G flat by playing those open and two. Make sure you play pedal G one and three and play pedal G flat one, two, and three. And for right now, I would just like for you to subscribe to my channel. Look down below and click the subscribe link. I would love to have you as a subscriber on my channel. I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one.
Thank you.